So let's recall what we did last time. Um, we we talked about piecewise linear knots and links in R3 or S3. Um, knots and links that are made out of straight lines, not necessarily the same length. Um, I'm not drawing anything knotted here, but just something made out of straight lines. And we talked about the uh, Rademeister Alexander and Briggs triangle moves, of which a typical example could be right here, where I draw the, I complete this triangle and the rest of the embedding does not go through the surface of the triangle. And that means that I am allowed by a triangle move to replace what we have here by that, like so. Um, and, um, and, uh, and then we went through um, how uh, by projection, um, we get that diagrams plus Rademeister moves suffice for ambient isotopy. Right. And the Rademeister moves are moves on projection diagrams and the zeroth Rademeister move is to apply a homeomorphism of the plane to or an isotopy that does not change any crossing structure. The first Rademeister move, an example of a first Rademeister move is to remove or add a curl. Um, of the second Rademeister move is to have um, something which goes under twice and can be pulled apart like that. And the third Rademeister move is a triangle, but not a triangle move necessarily, but it is an example of a triangle move if you configure it correctly, um, where we exchange like that. So what you are looking for in doing any of these moves on diagrams is a bit of isotopy not involving any crossings, a one-sided region, a two-sided region, or a three-sided region on which the crossings are configured in such a way that the move is allowed. And I have drawn uh, examples. There are other examples. You can switch that crossing. It will still be a, a move. You can switch this crossing and it will still be a move. But some things are not going to be allowed. For example, um, there is no, uh, no. Mm -hmm. No R3 move here. For example, right? And it's of course interesting to think back that you can generate these moves by looking at the projections and the cases, but I'm not going to go back into that. Um, along with the lecture from last week, I sent you or made available to you, I will do it again. Uh, there is a, I guess I should say, there is 
a Dropbox link. And it will be available on my web page. It probably will also be available on the information from Novosibirsk. But that Dropbox link will contain various papers, does contain various papers and things. Uh, and if I tell you that I have a thing you'd like to read, you might like to read, I'll put it there and so on. Um, so in regard to that, um, I sent you a short couple of pages uh, about the triangle moves, but I don't intend to do any more about the triangle moves right now. But on the other hand, we have an exercise which is good for your soul. So let me um, save this and um, tell you the exercise. So I'm saying that if you try to make a knot, you could try. Let's see. One, two, three, four. And I'm trying to make a knot. So maybe I'm going to try to go through here. Um, five. But I haven't managed to connect back to my initial point. One, two, three, four, five. I think the angles are are sufficient to allow me to actually construct some straight lines above it and get this far. And I can I can manage with six, but five cannot do it. In, five is not possible, and that's the exercise. That it is not possible to create a knot with five or less six. You really need six. You might try, if you don't feel like trying to prove something, get some toothpicks and try to make a knot out of toothpicks, and you'll see that you can with six and you can't with less. Um, but that's an exercise, all right? Um, and of course, there is an interesting problem here. And the problem is, which is not fully solved by any means, given A knot, say, what is the least number of sticks needed to make K? So in the case of the truffle knot, six is the answer. Um, it turns out that in the case of the figure eight knot, there's another knot for you to think about. The next simplest knot after the truffle knot, figure eight knot, truffle knot here. Of course, we're not worrying about sticks when we draw diagrams. We're just trying to make pretty diagrams. Here's the truffle knot. But here's a six stick representation of the truffle knot. Now, I'm not understand. I mean, we mean in R3, right? You can draw straight line diagrams, and that's another question. What's the least number of sticks? to make a knot using straight line diagrams. But straight line diagrams
do not always realize as straight sticks in R3. Just because you drew something with straight lines in the diagram doesn't mean that it's overlaid by an embedding with straight sticks in R3. Think about that for a moment while I get to my next slide, because um, I don't have room. Oh, I have room. Um, here's room. Here's one. So I'm drawing this badly because I didn't give myself enough room to draw. But I think you see what I've done here. This is, this is for example, with regard to that sentence there, straight line diagrams don't always realize as straight sticks in R3. Here's a perfectly good straight line diagram, five-sided star diagram representing a 2-5 torus knot. But I told you you can't do it with five, all right? And if you look at that diagram and try to bring it up into three space, you'll see that it's just not possible. The sticks were, are going to have to be broken, angled, uh, in order to do that. They would have to bend. You could have bent sticks up in space, which projected to straight lines in the plane. And that's what you will find here. And, um, and then to analyze exactly what is the relationship. How, for example, do I tell whether a flat straight line diagram that I draw is overlaid uh, by uh, an embedding or not, and um, and all the related geometry questions are not very well investigated. Um, next time, or perhaps when I give you the notes, I'll, I'll give you a reference or two about some literature about this, but this is an, an interaction of geometry and knot theory, which is not as well explored as it could be. And obviously very fundamental. So, so this is an exercise and also a research area if you're interested. Questions on this before I go to another slide? All right. So let's see what we can do with Rademacher moves. Um, and what, what can we do with knot diagrams? So let me uh, give you a uh, couple of facts about knot diagrams now. Um, here's one. It's a little drawing exercise. Draw any way you like, but always cross under after you've already crossed over. Cross, do the over crossings first and the under crossings second. And make as complicated a diagram as you care to make. So I started here and I over cross first. Sometimes that's called a descending diagram. It 
It is unmodded. By now you've looked at the diagram I drew, D, here. And of course you've seen that it's unmodded, I'm sure. But you weren't doing it by Reitermeister moves, if, if my guessing is correct. I doubt you were doing it by Reitermeister moves, but maybe you were. But you undoubtedly saw that it's just kind of curling on down. Let's draw another one just so we see a bit of very simple curling like this. Curling on down, always underneath itself as it goes along. And all you have to do is pull it upward, pull. up and it falls apart right so it's unknotted by a three-dimensional argument uh, a, a simple three-dimensional argument all you have to do is grab it and pull upward and um and everything comes apart right that's that's clear on the other hand Reitermeister theorem says D is equivalent by Reitermeister moves to the unknot. So you can present yourself with some puzzles to do here. Um, and they're easy puzzles in this case, not, not too troublesome. Let's go ahead and play with this one a little bit. Now, for that purpose, I'll take another slide. Thank you. Um, All right. Now I feel happy enough to do some erasures. So here's a one. Ah, now this is not a one move, right? A one move has to have a one-sided region, but this is a two move, and I can do this. So that was a two move, and here's a one move available. So I was just doing the cheap ones first. Now let's see if we have any problems or whether it's easy from here on. Looking for simplifying moves. Well, there aren't any, right? Um, there are some three moves here. There are lots of three moves. Here's a three move, for example, right? That's a nice three move. I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw it away. Uh, but there aren't any two moves. This could be a two move, but this was out of the way. Um, this is three-sided. So, so we're going to have to do a three move. Ah, but here's another exercise, which I'll leave to you to do, but I'll give you a hint. Uh, the exercise is... If a diagram has no two moves or one moves, oh. I better be careful or I'll tell you something false. That's always the case, isn't it? Um, but it'll make it easier for you to prove it too. If a flat diagram has no and no then it will have some triangles 
on the hint. If G is a plane graph, then vertices minus edges plus faces is equal to two, all oh, connected. Euler's formula, right? Um, let's uh, remind ourselves about Euler's formula in a small box over here. There's a, there's a knot graph, for example, and we have vertices is equal to three, and edges is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, and faces is equal to one, two, three, four, five. And vertices minus edges plus faces is equal to two, as Euler told us, right? That's Euler's formula for a plane graph in the case of the knot diagram. Now, you can simplify in the case of the knot diagram that formula a bit, but that's in back of this fact. And so you can have some fun proving this fact. You've got a connected, flat diagram. Doesn't have to be a knot diagram, could be a link diagram. It could be like uh, like this, a Borromean rings flat di link diagram. And you'll notice that there aren't any of these and there aren't any of these, but the rest of them are all triangles. It's all triangles everywhere, right? So it has lots of triangles. My exercise is amply satisfied, right? So, so this is a, a, a nice graph theory exercise to show that if you have a diagram and it doesn't have any curls and it doesn't have any loons, then it must have some three-sided regions in it. Okay. Um, so uh, in this case, there are some three-sided regions and you can use them to do randomized moves. Uh, and that's what we're going to have to do because otherwise there's no hope of unknotting it, right? The, that's the only kind of move that's left. Uh, unless we were going to make it more complicated like we did in the other case. But we won't have to for these. For these things, for these overcross first diagrams, you're going to find that you can simplify them and you, there will be enough Reitermeister removes to do so. Um, so in this case, for example, we could do a Reitermeister remove right there. and put it here. I can swing this arc across by the third move and it ends up over here, triangle to triangle. That's a third move. And um, um, if we do it, then we should see some opportunities after we've done it. I would hope. Maybe not, maybe it's the wrong move. Uh, let's see, are we in better shape now? Well, yes, I think so. Um, for example, here's a two move and you can simplify that by connecting it right over here. Uh, let's do that. I won't spend the whole class <laughs> simplifying this diagram, I'm just going along. Um, hmm? Mm-hmm. All right. And now what? Uh, looks like I need to do another three move before I can get going. And I can. I can do another three move there. And now you can see ahead a little bit. If I do a go across this triangle, then I'll be able to pull that in and it's starting to fall apart. It works. Um, so you might think, how would you organize a uh, proof by Reitermeister moves that the descending diagrams are all unknotted. Another exercise. If you like to do, the, do it by combinatorics. Uh, but I have a tendency being overly trained topologically that if I see a topological argument, then I don't worry about the combinatorics. But sometimes that's not such a good idea. Sometimes it's a really excellent idea to find the combinatorial way anyway. All right. So um descending diagrams are unknotted that means what does that mean that means something important it means that if you're facing a knot like you're facing this knot 
Uh, then there is a diagram, which is exactly like this diagram, but with different crossings, which is unknotted. See? Here's a descending diagram. And here's the truffle knot diagram. Same diagram. It says if you switch um, two crossings, but you didn't really need to switch that many. But if you switch these two crossings, um, oh, let me see. Oh, I only switched this one, didn't I? Yeah. Uh, in this case, I switched one crossing to get the descending diagram. Fine. So one crossing switched away from the trefoil is an unknotted diagram. And um, it's good to know for certain kinds of calculations that we'll get to that you can get the unknot diagrams from given knot diagrams. Okay. Um, so, so that's one bit of combinatorics about knot diagrams that's um, important to us. Here's another. I like this one very much, actually, and I might spend a few minutes on it. Um, suppose you have a knot diagram flat. I won't worry about the crossings at the moment. Or link diagram, just some diagram. Um, then I can color it with two colors. black and white. Always the case. How do you do it? Well, you just do it. But then we have to ask, why did it work? So I take a region and I color it black. Now I take another region not adjacent to it and I color it black. And I'm going to have it colored so that if two regions are adjacent, they're colored differently. So this must be white, that must be white. This has to be black. This has to be black. And this has to be black. We're done. So every flat diagram, which is a four regular plane graph, if you like to use graph theory terminology, every four regular plane graph can be two colored. Now, I leave that as an exercise for you. This is another one where, if you never thought about it before, it makes a very nice puzzle and, um, and problem for proving, right? Because um, it's trivial to see that it works. Just draw yourself a diagram and color it. It colors automatically under, under your hand. But why did that work? How come it, there's no contradiction? It's worth thinking about. Now I'm going to show you uh, a wonderful trick that you can use if you know this, if you know this, watch this. I am going to take each of the shaded crossings and I'm going to replace it by a particular choice of crossing structure like that. Okay, it's still shaded. But I'm going to put a crossing on it like that, okay? Now, that's, that's a choice. There are two possible ways to put in the crossing. But I'm putting in the crossing according to the following rule, that if you were, if you're looking at the shading, and if you were to rotate the overcrossing line counterclockwise, you go through the shaded regions. So... Counter, clock, turn of over crossing line sweeps black region. All right. So I'm going up to the diagram and I'm going to make that kind of a crossing at every place, okay? So that means that this would go like that, right? And this one uh, would go like that. 
and this one um, would go like that. And this one would go like that. And this one would go like that. This one would go like that. Another way of thinking about it is you cut an undercrossing with black on your left. It doesn't matter whether you're coming in this way or that way. Cut the undercrossing with black on your left. So what do you see? What you see is that the resulting weave is alternating. Alternating over, under, over, under, over, under, over, under, over, under, always all that way, going all the way around the diagram. You can see that that has to happen by just looking at what happens to two nearby crossings. See, so go here, and then you have another crossing here. Uh, let's say I draw it um, so that it alternates but consider the shading. You see how once this is chosen going under, then the next one has to go under this way and it's alternating. So it's locally alternating and that means it's alternating. It's just any two crossings alternate makes it alternating. So, so what we concluded is that the fact that your diagram is colorable with two colors, black and white, tells you that you can also form alternating sequence of crossings and there will be no contradiction there. Um, alternation is a consequence of coloring and that means that every diagram has an alternating structure if you want to choose the crossings that way. So every diagram has an unknotted diagram if you do the descending diagram and every diagram has an alternating structure if you use the coloring to think about that. And so you have an exercise to prove the important lemma that every uh, diagram is colorable. And we can discuss proofs next time, right? Um, any questions about this one? All right, um, let's go on and actually produce some invariants now. Um, one, one thing that's useful is orientation. You don't have to have just an unoriented knot diagram like this one. Uh, you can decide on a narrow on the diagram like that. And then you could consider whether this diagram and this diagram, the very same diagram, but I put a different arrow on this one, and you move one into the other. And, and um, in fact, you can, I claim. I claim that it's possible by writing my moves to change this diagram into that one. There are some diagrams that cannot be changed if you keep the arrow on the diagram. But I leave this one as an exercise for you also, exercise that you can change a, a, a trefoil knot with a given structure like that. Just reverse the arrow 
on the whole diagram um, goes around the opposite way that it's possible to move this around until it turns into that, right? Um, now, uh, with links, orientation gives us something to count. So for example, so suppose I take this link and orient the two components like that. The simplest link I can imagine. Well, everyone would probably agree that this should have linking number one, but I haven't defined the linking number, but the linking number of A with B, the two components, is equal to one. And I want to tell you how I'm going to define linking numbers so that that counts correctly. You want to count how many times one curve goes around the other curve. And one way to do this, the simplest combinatorial way to do this, is to assign to crossings of the two oriented types signs. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to assign this to sign plus one. And this one, the sign minus one. And this is just a convention. This is the sign convention. So you have to memorize this sign convention. It's the standard one we'll use. You can understand, uh, one way to rem remember it is that you put your fingers of your right hand in the direction of the overcrossing line then your thumb will point in the direction of the undercrossing line if you are looking at a positive crossing. You can try that. Fingers in the direction of the overcrossing line, thumb points in the direction of the under. In the case of the negative crossing, the thumb will be pointing in the wrong direction. Take this link here. Let's magnify it. What is the sign of the crossing here? Well, you see, if you put your fingers of your right hand in this direction, your thumb points this way, so this is plus. And what about this one? Well, it's also plus. So I have two plus crossings. And now I'm going to give you the definition of the linking number. The linking number of two curves is equal by definition to the summation over C belonging to crossings of A with B. So a crossing with, of A with B means that, um, that one of these lines is in A and the other line is in B. I am not interested in crossings of the curve with itself, of which there aren't any here. Crossings, the sign of a crossing and divided by two. So we get one half and one half here. The linking number is equal to one half plus one half, which is equal to one. All right? So this is the definition of the linking number. Now, it makes sense to call it one half because it goes around halfway. You see, one, one line in crossing goes around halfway. It goes around like 100, almost 180 degrees. And when you do it twice, you see you went halfway and then you went the other way and you came back to where you started. That's one whole turn. So, one half for each crossing. So of course we have the following result, that if you have a link which is equal to the union of two components oriented, and you define the linking number of the link to be equal to the linking number of A with B to be equal to one half the sum of C belonging to the crossing, so A would be uh, epsilon of C you notice I have the one and a half out here now. Um, then the linking number of bell is 
unchanged by Rademeister moves. So that means that this is an invariant of the link. This is this is something that is telling you that the linking number, for example, of the link that we just looked at, um, that tells us that there is no way by Reitermeister moves to separate those two components. And since we have Reitermeister Briggs Alexander theorem, which says that that works in three space, that means there is no way to separate these by isotopy in three space. Um, and how do we prove this? Well, I won't write the words of the proof. I'll just point out that this has no contribution. Because C does not belong to the crossings of A with B. Right? Well, that's the first part of the proof. Self-crossings just don't contribute to linking numbers. Then what happens here? Aha! Well, this might be curve A and this might be curve B and we can consider the orientation. Well, maybe this is A and this is B. And then what, what signs do we have here? We have a plus sign here and we have a minus sign there. So, uh, and this is equivalent by the second Reitermeister remove to this. But you see, you would have added one minus one half and plus one half. So minus one half plus one half equals zero. Check. No, no, no change under doing a Reitermeister move. That would be the only difference between the linking number here and the linking number here. There we'd have a plus and a minus. Um, and then we need the third Reitermeister move. Oh, you can do the other case. You you should have thought about the other case if you oriented it this way. And then you had a third, a second right of my move like that, right? But then what are the signs now? Um, let's see, that one's minus. And uh, we're coming along here and this one's plus. So no difference in terms of the sign situation, but the orientations are a little different. That's okay to do. And then with the third randomizer move, there are more cases of orientation. I'll just draw one. Let's say we have this one, right? And we did a, a an R3 move, and we went from here to here. And let's take a look at the sign situation. Um, what's the sign here? Not minus. And the sign here is minus. And the sign here is minus, all three minuses. Is that right? Did I make a mistake? Min minus, minus, and minus, yes. Now what happened here? This one is the same, still minus. This one is minus. And this one is minus. So the signs are all the same. Now what about component-wise? Maybe this is A and this is B, right? And this could be A or B. Um, uh, let's suppose it's B, okay, just for the sake. So then this would be A, and here is B and B. Right. And given that, which ones are we counting? Well, this is A to B, so we count that. And this is um, uh, a B to B, and we don't count that. And this one is A to B, and we count this. Now over here, um, this one is B to B and we don't count it. And here's the two minuses again and we count them. So you see the sum of plus and minus does not change. You can check. the other cases. And that completes the proof.
So we have that the linking number is an invariant of the link, and it definitely, if you have two links that have different integer linking number, then they're different. So this is a great piece of theory. And it tells us, for example, that um, here's a link of linking number one. and so on. So we have linking numbers of any given integer number. And if somebody hands you a link, uh, it's quite natural to check out the linking numbers and see what you can say about it from that point of view. But this is a weak invariant, and there are links with linking number zero that are still linked. There exist links with linking number equal to zero and still linked. For example, Now, I will orient this for you just for the heck of it, but it really won't matter what orientation I do, it will come out zero. But you see, I have this one circulating this way, and this one goes up, let's say. But then it turns around, it comes back down. So you can see that the two contributions to linking number from here and here are canceled out by the two contributions to linking number from here to here, because you reverse this arrow. And these two do not contribute to the linking number at all, right? They're self-crossings of that component. So I call this link W for J.H.C. Whitehead, who is the person who first studied this link and its linking number, so it seems, for his own purposes. At least he studied it fairly deeply. I think that Tate, who made the not tables, was aware of the Whitehead link. We can check the history. But this has linking number zero. And if you were to make it out of rope, you would quickly become convinced that it is linked. You can't get rid of it. There's no way to undo it. But we want to prove that. And I think we're going to prove that before 11.30 tonight, before the end of class, all right? I, I'm advertising that we could prove that. Another very well-known link that has linking number zero is coming up. We should prove that, that one's linked as well. That is the E O I I always have trouble spelling it. The Borman rings. Now, in this case, there are three components. But if you remove any one component, the, the, what I have is that the linking number of A with B is zero. The linking number of A with C is equal to zero. And the linking number of B with C is equal to zero. All the linking numbers vanish. Um, you can see that, in fact, because 
if you remove any one of A, B, and C, then the link falls apart. Right? Uh, maybe rather than remove it, I'll just color one of them uh, in another color a little thickly. So this one. And then you see quite clearly that if I remove the red, then A is over C, and so they fall apart. And in fact, it's that overness thing that is going on. A is over, well, I didn't do the greatest job, did I? A is over C, all right. So A is over C, and C is over B. and B is over A, right? B lies entirely over A, A lies entirely over C, C lies into this, so it's a scissors, paper, stone arrangement. Um, intuitively, that's somehow how they're linked because of the scissors, paper, stone arrangement of them. But, um, but again, it behooves us to find a mathematical proof that these links won't come apart and linking number is not going to help us. So, I want to construct some information that will get us an invariant. And I'm going to begin by introducing you to a very simple algebra, which I'm going to call the three-color algebra. Go back to black. The three-color algebra has um, um, members R, B, and G. Okay, red, blue, and green. Um, and here's it's a there's a one uh, one a unary operation, all right? Red times red is red, blue times blue is blue, and blue times green, and and, and green times green is green. R squared equals R b squared equals b, g squared equals g. And then the rest of it is r, b equals g, and then I'll just say over here, et cetera. But I'll write out the multiplication table so you understand clearly what I mean by et cetera. So the product of any two of them is the third, r, b is g, r, g is b, b, r is g, b, g is r, g, r is b, g, b is uh, R, all right? Product of any two different ones is the third, closes on itself. Simplest algebra you could imagine that closes on itself. Um, seems like might be related to the integers mob three and it is, as we'll see in a, in a few minutes. But this algebra is, um, for all it's being simple, um, it's not associative. right out. RB times G is equal to G times G, which is equal to G. But R times BG is equal to R times R, which is equal to R. And of course, we're given that these are distinct. Three distinct members of the algebra, right? All right, so it's not associated, but that, that's actually good. Um, it has some very nice properties, however, and I'm going to write them here. We're just gonna do a little algebra first. It has the following properties, that x times x 
is equal to x for any x. Yeah, well, I defined it that way. That x times y, and then again times y, is equal to x for any x and y. And that's kind of obvious, isn't it? Just like what happened here. Um, if these are different, then that would be z, but then the z would be different from the y, and you would get back to x because there are only three. So here it's quite clear why it has this idempotent property. And then the third property is a very nice property, which might not at all be obvious at first, but it is true. And that is that if you take x and y and then you multiply by z, you get the same result as if you took x and you multiplied it by z, and then you took y and you multiplied it by z. In other words, it's self-distributive on the right. Now, let's just check that that one works here with one example, and I leave it to you to check that it's general on this little algebra. But let's take RBG, which wasn't associated there. But what, what if we get, what if we looked at RG times BG, which would be the other side of this for RBG, right? And but RB, RG is B, and BG is R, and BR is G, and so that works, right? And you can check that this self-distributivity is true here as well. So now what I want to show you, and then we'll go over to using it to prove that some knots are not trivial, is that somehow this wise little algebra knows about the Reitermeister moves, because these are the Reitermeister moves. These are the algebraic versions of the Reitermeister moves. We'll see. Oh, an algebra that satisfies this is called an unoriented quandle. There will be an oriented quandle, but this is an unoriented quandle. It's a little bit simpler in its axiomatics than the oriented quandle. Quandles are related to the fundamental group of the complement of the knot, as we'll see as we go along, probably next week. Um, and they were invented as an algebraic way of studying knot theory by a number of people. David Joyce, who did a thesis on them in 1979. Sergei Matveyev, who called them um, 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 automorphic sets. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, distributive groupoids, excuse me, and Breeze Corner called them automorphic sets. And, uh, and the algebra structures have come up in other circumstances as well, such as in differential geometry. But leave it as it is. Let's look at the Reitermeister moves and see that these properties are in fact algebraic translations of our three Reitermeister moves. Well, how am I going to get the algebra in relation to the knots? Well, that's a very simple idea. I'm going to label the arcs in the diagram of the knot with elements of the algebra. And I'm going to have it in such a way that if Y is the overcrossing line and X is the undercrossing line, then what happens here is the product X times Y. Now you'll notice uh, a fundamental logical point. If this is to be well-defined, then the following had better work, that I should be able to apply it to x times y here and y here and get back to x. So I would have, if I started here, x, y, and then I would have applied y to it. Ah, but that's okay, it's equal to x. So you see, axiom two is actually well-definedness in the unoriented quantile. But it's also the second Reitermeister move. I, I jumped to the second Reitermeister move. Let's watch. I have this labeled X, I have this labeled Y. Y comes all the way around because I am labeling the arcs in the diagram, the arcs. An arc in a knot diagram starts broken, wanders around and breaks somewhere. That's an arc, right? So for example, in the truffle knot, 
I have three arcs. And I could label them red, blue, and green. So I have labeled the truffle knot with the three with the three color quandle. Hmm? But here, XY, this is XY. And then it meets Y, so it becomes XY meeting Y, which is Y. And so that would be the color of the outgoing line, XY, Y. But this is equal to X by our axiom. And that means that if I pulled it apart, this could be labeled Y and this would be labeled X and this is equivalent by the second Reitermeister move. You see, there's no problem. If this was colored, then this will be colored. I can induce a coloring of this diagram from a coloring of this diagram or vice versa because of this move, because of this algebraic move. So that this is equal to this corresponds precisely to being able to mutually color the two diagrams that are related by a Reitermeister move. Second Reitermeister move. Let's go and look at the first. Here's the first. This is x, this is x, and out comes x times x, which is equal to x by our axiom, and that is equivalent to having not had it at all. So this could continue on being labeled x throughout the rest of the diagram. So again, a diagram which is colored will still be colored after I do the move or before. And what about the third? Third is the most interesting one. So in this case, I am taking a specific case of the third Reitermeister move where this goes over like that. Um, and you can check the other case, but this one is the one that gives the simplest example of this distributive law. So I'm going to have an X here and a Y here and a Z here. I'm going to look at the Reitermeister move. So this would be X and this would be Y. And this will be Z. And let's see how the colors propagate. This equivalent by the third move. Well, X, Y, so this is X, Y. And then Z, meet Z, so this is X, Y, and then meet Z. Z goes all the way down to here. And Y meet Z and becomes Y, Z. Okay, so now everything is colored. Now what happened here? Y meet Z, so this is Y, Z. X meet Z, so this is X, Z. And then XZ meets YZ, right? Not Y, but YZ. So we have XZ meets YZ. And we have agreed that these are equal. And they're the only possible problem in going from here to here. If this was colored and you pushed it, then the fact that this has the same color as this means that you can and induce the coloring on the new diagram. So we're good for all three Reitermeister moves. And you see that the three Reitermeister moves correspond to the algebraic moves x, x equals x, x, y, y equals x, and x, y, z equals x, z. Y, Z. So, let's go back to the truffle knot and take a look, take a closer look at what this is telling us. How are we doing? We've got a few more minutes. So here's the truffle knot. And it's colored in our three color algebra, R, B, G. And, and now let's examine, do a little um, examination of what happens to it if we move it around. So for example, suppose that I decide to do a second Reitermeister move right there. Now before I did it, there was G here and there was G here, right? G and G, and then this G is over here, and this G is over here, and they're both meeting red, 
and G meets red gives you blue, and that's still colored. You see, so that's an example of it's still colored after I did the randomized remove. And then I could continue this process, um, and this would be colored B, that's colored B, and I move this up here. And now these would be colored B times G is R. And I could keep on going. I'm going to connect that, but I keep on going. And I go up through R. And R times R is R. So those stay the same. They stay R. And then I could move through B here. And, and I'll stop. And I get G. So by doing three R2 moves, I have a more complicated colored diagram. And then, and then I could do a yet another randomized remove. I could take this guy here and slip him under the triangle over to here so that he would go here and come back out here, right? That would be a three move, three move from here to here. And this would have to be erased. Now what we have here is that this is green, and this was R coming up into R, right? Oh, I, it looks like I made a mistake. Red, blue, green. Um, red, blue, green. Um, what color is, oh, this is green. Um, or was it wasn't colored. Green, red, it was blue. This is blue. Blue. Yeah, this is blue. Okay, that's that's fine. But this is the place where you could worry because you see I have red and blue producing somebody. They produce a green. Over here I have green and green producing green. It worked, right? Um, so it's still colored. But of course that's the associative law, that's the self-distributive law happening. Um, if you went back to what we did theoretically a little while ago, it will always work when we have a tri when we have a, a bit of triangle. You can look at what bit of triangle we had. We had blue coming down to blue. Um, uh, we had red. Um, we had red coming in here, and green coming out here. Red, blue, green, and then um, and then we had somebody here going across, and we could just do an example, or it could be this one. Let's say it's red. Red, red, um, red and red make red. Red and blue make green. So I guess I, I'll just do that example, all right? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm forgetting who was labeled. Just going to do another example here. This is blue. Red and blue make green. Okay, that's that's before a randomized remove. And um, and if we're going to do this, we have to be careful to know who's labeled by whom. Okay, so this line is labeled red. Red and red make red. Blue, green, and so on. And now I'm going to do the randomized remove. Well, this is red and this is blue. This is blue. Red and blue make green. And now we push this line down underneath, and the line it begins with red. Red and blue make green, and green and red make blue. Uh -oh. Green and green make green. Sorry. Yeah, I'm rushing. But it worked, right? So, do so you see that if you started with a truffle knot labeled red, blue, and green, and you start wandering along, doing randomized removes, you go into an infinity of diagrams and at every step you get a coloring of that diagram. So we proved uh, an arcane coloring theorem for diagrams equivalent to the truffle knot. Every diagram equivalent to the truffle knot can be colored with three colors. That is, if you think carefully about what happened here, you don't lose any colors. Uh, since we're out of time, Oh, that's another exercise. No colors lost. On a knot.
Now, I better tell you about that. Just bear with me. You could worry the colors could get lost. Let me show you why you should worry. Here's red, here's blue, here's green, here's blue. And we do a right of monster move and we get red and blue. And it seems we lost green, right? But this is supposed to be a knot diagram that's colored. And somehow as you wander throughout the knot diagram, oh, I'm gonna say this on another slide so it's easier to understand. This is supposed to be part of a one component diagram. So that means that you take a walk starting here and you're going to go through all sorts of things and eventually you'll end up here or here, all right? One or the other. And you never go through here. But you started out in red and you ended up in blue. And that means that somewhere along the way, you must have transformed red to blue. And the only way to transform red to blue is if there's a green. So that implies that there exists a green, not this one. There has to be another green somewhere because of the fact that there's a walk, which takes you from red to blue. So that means that when you, when you do a, a, a simplifying Reitermeister 2 move, which you might do in the course of your moving it around, uh, you won't lose any colors. And so it starts out pre-colored and it's always pre-colored no matter what happens. You can't get to the unknot then. You can't get to it because the unknot has only one color. And so we proved that the truffle knot is knotted because you can't get to the arm knot. With a link, you can lose a color. We could have a three colored link like this. Red, blue, green. And we do a Rademeister two move and we're down to red and blue. Links can lose colors. But knots can't. So if you can three color a knot, that's our only example of a quandle at this point. If you can three color a knot, it's knotted. Doesn't matter. Okay? Um, so, so now I promised you that I would prove that the whitehead link was linked. And I will, and that'll be the end of this talk. So we'll talk more about quandles and fundamental group and, and related matters next time. And we'll get to things like Jones polynomial soon enough too. Um, just have to do things in some order, right? Um, I want to show that this guy is linked. If this was equivalent by Reitermeister moves to the unlink, then W can be non trivially recolored. Do you see it? Why? Because you see, you could start with the unlink and color one of them red and the other blue, let's say. 
And then we're moving them around to form other things. You do a Rademeister move and you get red, blue, green. And then maybe you do some more. Maybe you pull this along and so on. Dot, 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 dot. And any link that you get uh, by the time you've done this will have greater than or equal to two colors. Right? Because you started with two colors. If it had only one color, you could go backwards along every move and you would end up with this coloring with only one color. But it has started with two. So that means that there must be a non-trivial coloring of any link that is equivalent to the unlink. I'm arguing in the exact opposite way that I did for the non. If, if this is unlinked, then W can be non-trivially recolored. Fact. W is uncolorable except by one color. Everybody's colorable with one color. There's no three coloring of W. You can try it. Let's try it just for fun and then we'll quit. Suppose that I gave this to be red and that to be blue and I will try coloring it. Must be some crossing, we'll try it there. Red, blue, green, okay. Red down here, green, red and green. Now let's see, um, um, blue and red make green here, right? So I have red and blue make green here and green coming back here, green here. Green and red meeting along this edge and what about here? This was blue. So blue comes back here, but green and red make blue, but blue and green make red. And that's a contradiction. So you follow the feedbacks in this, in this system of feedbacks and find that if you assume that you had it colored with two distinct colors somewhere, then it will all snap back on itself and give you a contradiction. You can try a couple of other cases and you'll become completely convinced. W is uncolorable in that sense. And therefore, W is linked. So we proved that the truffle knot was knotted by proving that it was three colorable. And we proved that the whitehead link is unlinked, is linked by proving that it's not colorable. And both methods are very powerful. Um, and you can go a long way just using three colors, but next time I'll show you a lot of other algebras that satisfy the quantal axioms. And so there's a rich, there's a rich uh, repository of algebraic structure that can be used to study knots and links by this quantal idea. And that's a good place for us to stop today. Questions?